What do you do when your journey, your life of following Jesus takes you to a place of pain and obscurity? What inner conversation you have with yourself? What conclusions do you make of God when you are in that space? Laura and I, we are celebrating 10 years of marriage this week. And our journey started quite cool. Uh, we met in Australia at birth. And we both were in that space of like, God, I just want to follow you. Like, I don't want to just get distracted by trying to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend. We want to actually surrender our part our, our, our lives in a full sense to you, including that relationship part. And we met when we were there. So we thought, wow, this is so cool. I think it's worth trusting God. And we had a long distance relationship and God helped us throughout that time. And and Laura came to live in Indonesia for a bit. She studied fashion design there and started introducing her to my parents. And at the beginning, they were, they were cool, they were chill. But then when conversations about wedding came up they started became they started to become quite hostile towards Laura they didn't talk to her um it just it just she was just not someone that they expected to be or um just not what they had in mind and things just get so complicated after three years four years of constantly trying to talk back and forth conversations after conversations council with our, uh, with our pastor in Jakarta, with our friends. We ended up getting married here in Cape Town without my parents from Indonesia. I remember those were probably two or three toughest years of my life. It was a roller coaster of trusting God, fasting, and trying to have a conversation with my parents. And things just blew up. And then trusting God again. Um, praying again and, and fasting and all do all these things, but things just never went well. Um, I remember wrestling with doubts, anger, and, and where are you, God? And my, my thought life just went through the dumps, even went through the suicidal thought sometimes. And and it's fine now we have kids, we have recon- we are reconciled, and it's awesome, but that was very hard. What's your struggle? You also have a struggle. If you don't have any... This is a little prophecy. You will, because all of the follower of Jesus, all throughout the the generation, we will go through pain and obscurity as a part of the package. And um, what do we do in moments like that? Today, a lot of churches all over the world is zooming into this Palm Sunday event. Perhaps if you don't grow up around church, you're like, what is going on here? A lot of palm branches, donkeys. We have a donkey at kids church even what does it mean even for our journey here in 2023 perhaps a lot of you are in a place of pain and obscurity we are in the last week as well in our good news people series perhaps for a lot of you you think good news my life's actually quite battered by bad news here's my prayer from today i pray that today as we deal and wrestle and and teach from scripture i pray that this will be like a time bomb in your heart you're watching this in your room by yourself you're, you're scrolling through your phone and you just bump into this may this be like a time bomb that the holy spirit deposit into the creases of your heart and today as we prep our hearts for easter as we just go through our life may this time bomb of truth explodes into wonder and worship so would you pray with me lord jesus come and deposit something in our hearts. Come Holy Spirit, anoint this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna read today from Luke 19, and as we read, I want you to imagine yourself in this story. I want you to taste, see, and smell the the, the vibe and what's going on in this event in Luke 19. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as King. After Jesus had said this, he went ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his two of his disciples saying to them, "Go to the village ahead of you. 
and as you enter it, you'll find a cold tide day, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. Imagine this fresh donkey day. It's been there all along. If anyone asks you why you're untying it, say the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. I'm imagining the scene the, in the action movie when the, the, the police was trying to chase these bad guys and, and they go through the traffic and one of the guys said, LAPD, and the guy actually just gave his car away for the bigger mission than just his, him going to work. Perhaps for the donkey owner, it was like that. It was an act of worship and submission to the king, a submission to something bigger than just the, his own purpose in raising that donkey. The king can have my donkey. The king needs it. The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks, cloaks on the colt, pulled, pulled Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. Imagine your expensive jackets, that's the only one you have. People then wasn't, they wasn't, they were not, they were not rich cloaks where they probably only had one cloak with them. These were prized possessions to them. This was an act of worship. They didn't just take out their clothes and put it down on the dirt for anybody. The Roman citizens would also put their cloaks or fine linens on the statue of their gods then to make them not angry or to worship him. So Jesus was something special, someone special, and they acknowledge it, they worship him. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracle they had seen. Imagine this place like the waterfront in December holiday. There were a lot of visitors from out of town. People were there to celebrate this big Jewish holiday, remembering how God saved them out of slavery in Egypt. It was a holiday of Passover. And, and, and they started the song, the song that's been, they've been, they've been, they, 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 they knew since they were kids. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. In the other accounts, they were waving palm branches and singing Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd say to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Have you wept before? What causes you to weep? How did your body feel when you weep? Was your chest tight? Was your face became to be quite a mess? Let that image stick. Jesus wept. And the, 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 the reading continues, but we We'll, we'll, we'll go back to that later. But here's the title for today. Palm branches, expensive jackets, and an ugly crying king. How many of you follow the Fast and the Furious series? I have lost count, but I actually Googled it. In this year, they're gonna launch Fast and Furious 10. Then Fast and Furious 11 will be the last, they say. You don't know this movie with Finn Diesel, Dominic Toretto, Street racing, straight street racing, doing outrageous stuff, a very deep movie. It's been a long day without you, my friend. I wonder if you know how they live in Tokyo. Man, I wanted to be that Asian guy in Fast and Furious. You can start watching Fast and Furious then and still get the, the, the movie, but you'll miss out on a lot of things if you didn't follow the sequels. You're wondering deeply what his Fast and Furious has to do with Palm Sunday. Hear this. This Palm Sunday is a part of one big sequels to God unfolding redemption story of God's unrelenting will and heart to renew you, your family, our humanity, and the world. And in order for us to experience the fullness of Palm Sunday, allow me we're going to take a bit of time here to, to zoom out, to paint a quick, big picture of the whole sequels of the kingdom of God. Fast and Furious 1. It started with when the kingdom was first established. 
the union of the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit created humanity in their own image to be like them, to subdue and have dominion over the nature. Now, this word kingdom, subdue, dominion, it didn't, it doesn't feel good to speak about it at the moment because it has negative connotations. But it wasn't the intention. The intention was pure. The intention was to create something out of nothing, to subdue the wind, to make electricity. My friend Stephen subduing borehole water into drinkable water, to subdue wild rivers, to build dams and cities and civilizations, to subdue rocks and shape it, build houses, build families, build gardens, enjoy each other, to take delight in the friendship with the Trinity of God and the nature and, and creating civilization. Sequel two, two foolish rebels fell into the deceit of the original rebel, the devil himself, wanted to establish their own kingdom, determining their own pattern, determining the way of living the good and evil on their own terms. It didn't work out so well after all. Brothers, sisters, family, murdering each other out of jealousy, failed marriages, bipolar disorder, cancer, divorce, racism, exploitations of nature, women, people, children, colonialism, you name it, 2023 here now, we still experience the consequences of this untrusting, foolish rebellion. Sequel three, God from the sequel one hasn't changed and cannot change and will not change. His will and his heart is unrelenting. It's still the same. He says, I will be their God, they will be my people, and I will live among them. That's been his heart from day one. Let's make it personal. He's saying to you, I will be your God. All these other gods that you rely on will fail you. Your money will fail you. Your strength will fail you. Your success will someday fail you. Only God that cannot fail. You will be my people. He said to you and to me, because we are dear to him. He wants to have friendship with us and I will live among you. Let's create civilization. Let's create something together. Let's build something together. That's the story of the kingdom of God. And he initiated this redemption process. First, by setting apart some people from, from this broken world to, to, to partner with him in this redemption story. Noah, Abraham, the nation of Israel, they set apart to be good news people, to be the light that shines, that bridge the gap between society and God. But this infection from the rebellion hasn't healed. It's like a deep wound that needs something bigger than just what's on the outside to heal. They were becoming just like other nations political alliances, unhealthy ones, greed, sexual immorality, exploitations, they ended up being defeated and being judged. But all throughout this story of the failure of Israel, they had been promised that God is faithful, that God will come back as the king to establish his kingdom. And we come into the sequel four where this event, where the Palm Sunday is at. Jesus, after a few hundred years of waiting for this king to come back, the up and down, the pattern of humanity infected by this rebellion, we entered into this AD time marked by the birth of Jesus, born out of Virgin Mary in a little obscure town called Bethlehem. He lived in obscurity most of his life. Until three years just before he was killed, he started his ministry. Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. He said, the time has come. The kingdom is here. Come home, repent, and believe this good news. He healed people. He restored people's dignity. People's dignity. He defended the women and the children. He lifted up the poor. He exposed the exploitations of the weak. He was the living incarnation of sequel one. This is where the Palm Sunday scene happened the last week of Jesus' life. In the last three years, he had been proclaiming the kingdom of God and implying that he's actually the king who's bringing the kingdom together. But, but the, some people recognize it. Actually, you are the king. You are the Messiah that we've been waiting for. But he's been, he had been telling them, keep it on the down low. My time has not come yet. 
finally, in this last week, this is the time where he announced it, where he actually pro formally announced that he is the king of this kingdom that he's bringing. But there's something so obscure and anticlimactic about this kingly inauguration. Normally, a king will come on a war force with, with all the parade and everything. And after an entry like this, usually there'll be food, parties, honoring ceremonies. If the king had just won the war, they came into town, they'll be parading the, um, the, the captives and everything all throughout town, and they'll have big, massive party. But this king, coming into a world that values might and strength and being good at war, the world invaded by the smell of toxic masculinity, defiantly this king ride on a donkey colt, pure, meek, empathizing with his people. Maybe his feet was dragging on the ground because the donkey was low and his eyes lock eyes with his own people. Some historian even assumed that Pontius Pilate at this same time was arriving to Jerusalem on his war horse because he needs to make sure that the Passover is under control because this holiday has a political undertone to it. But Jesus on a cold of a donkey ended up not with a big party or with a declaration of war, but ended up with him weeping, ugly crying on top of the donkey. And few days after that, on a Friday, the king was found naked, humiliated, brutally murdered, hanging on the tree, mocked, king of the Jews, he said. Where is the victory? Where is the setting the captives free? Where is the turning joy from mourning? People turn from Hosanna to crucify him in four days. The people turn from admitting that he is the king to telling the people that, telling him that you're a fraud. Nobody had imagined when God came back, he would look like a young prophet, cheeks stained with tears, riding on a donkey, and he writes, he's too obscure to be king. He feels too much pain. How can a king weeps like that. He should have been leading a military revolt to overturn the Roman government by now. Why is he hanging on the cross, defeated? When university, one of my friends said to me, your God is dead and naked. How can he be God if he's dead, hanging on the cross? I want to stop here for a moment. Is it possible for you and for me to make conclusions too early about God, especially when we're in times of pain and obscurity. The crowd turned from Hosanna to crucify him because the king didn't fit his day picture. What conclusion do you make of God? We're in the place of pain and obscurity. Is he distant? Does he see? Does he care? Is he act does he actually exists and here and in control or, or life is just a series of random events after all. We perhaps not necessarily drifting or, 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 or switching from Hosanna to crucify him, but easily we drift from Hosanna, from praising him, from trusting him into apathy. We use apathy as a coping mechanism of experiencing this faith roller coaster. We don't like living in obscurity. We want to draw conclusion. Rather, we have apathy. The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness, it's indifference. The opposite of faith is not heresy, it's indifference, it's apathy. And the opposite of life is not death, it's indifference. Jesus weeping is the far opposite of apathy, I reckon. I want to encourage you today, if you find yourself in the space of weeping, you are a healthy person. Actually, a healthy adult is someone that can weep and that can rejoice comfortably. If you're in that space of weeping, I want to encourage you, there will be time where this weeping and mourning will be turned into joy. If you're in that space of apathy, Here's a word for you. He sees you. He understands you. 
and he wants you to trust in him. Palm branches, expensive jackets, and an ugly crying king. Can we still wave our palm branches as a sign of hope for the future and lay down our worship to him and give him our worship even when the king doesn't do what we think he should do? Because sequel one didn't end up, didn't end there. Sequel, I mean, sequel four didn't end there. Sequel four ended on Sunday. The king descended into hell, plucking humanity away from the core of the darkness itself. He defeated death. Death, oh death, where is your sting? Jesus has the final say. Sequel four ended in an empty tomb. Now, 2023. We're in the middle of sequel four and sequel five. Jesus is coming back again. My friend who is a pastor in Canada posted this the other day and I thought this is very good. I'm just going to show it on the screen. We live in this tension between already and not yet. We live in this tension between the, the future and the present. We live in this tension between heaven and earth. We live in this tension between between the, um, the the hope for our future and the pain and the obscurity that we feel now. As good news people, we're called to live well with this tension. And apathy is not the way. I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna leave you with these three thoughts. Palm branches. Think about our hope for our future. We wanna live in this tension with our eyes to the future, with our eyes to the Messiah that is coming back again. He will set things right. He will rescue us from the oppression of sin and death. Expensive jackets, think of our worship. Think of our worship that costs something to us. But it's a gesture of trust to Him, even in the place of pain and obscurity. This image of an ugly crying king would you stay faithful to him even when the king doesn't act the way you want him to act? Don't deny him. Don't be drowned out by the voices of the crowd. Fix your eyes to him. Weep with him. Rejoice with him. Because at the end, this is all going to be good. We live in this tension with hope, with worship, and faithfulness. Just because the road is obscure doesn't mean the plan and the promise has changed. And read this Revelations 19 on your own time. There's going to be a time, this is a prophecy for the future. The king is coming back again, not on a donkey this time, but on a war horse, setting everything right. King of kings and lord of lords. Store this in the creases of your heart. Let it be a time bomb for your life. I want to close this story today with the story of Perpetua. Two women, Perpetua and Felicity. Perpetua was 22, from a good family, well-educated, married, and was nursing an infant son. By AD 200, Christians in North Africa were routinely arrested and executed. The Roman Empire was held together by a strictly enforced loyalty towards the emperor as a lord, not just politically, but this lord wanted to be worshipped as well. Christians believing that the lord was Jesus and Jesus is the only one worth of our worship, often seen as the enemies of the state. Perpetua and a lot of her friends were arrested, got sent to prison. In the prison, he was forced to deny Jesus, but she denied. Her dad, Perpetua's dad, visited her in prison and reminded her about her family, her education, and her son. Why do you give these things up? Just deny Jesus and worship the emperor. Perpetua declined. She nurses her child in prison before arranging for him to be given to her mother. Perpetua got a couple of visions from God, realizing that she will be a martyr. This sentence is paused. 
Perpetua and other Christians are to be thrown to wild animals in the public arena on the emperor's birthday. She went back cheerfully to prison, her friends. The day has come. Perpetua and her friends ask if they can have a meal together before they die. They share bread, they drink wine together and have communion in that day. The authorities plan to dress the Christians in pagan clothing for execution, but Perpetua refuses and in the end they are forced to allow her and her friends to wear ordinary clothes. Perpetua and the others enter the arena with radiant, shining faces and a calm step. They challenge the crowd, reminding them that they too must face judgment. At the crowd's demand, they are whipped by gladiators. One by one, they face, they face savage animals. The men were attacked by a boar, a bear, and a leopard, while the women are attacked by furious horned cows. Wounded, Perpetua is thrown down, concerned that her disveiled hair might indicate to the spectators that she was grieving instead of joyful. Perpetua asked for a pin to put her hair back in place. The decision is now taken to the wounded Christians. They gave each other a kiss of peace, then half their throats cut. Perpetua held palm branches right into eternity, being welcomed by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Friends, can we do that too? I want to invite us, with whether our, our road in front of us is filled with pain, obscurity, or victory, I want to invite you, I want to invite myself, hey, Let's wave our palm branches high. Let's, let's, let's lay down our expensive jackets, our expensive worship. Let's lay down our own life to worship the King and let's be faithful to Him right to the end. Because together with Perpetua and a lot of other people that has gone before us, they are cheering us on. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Jesus is King. Before we pray, and close the service. It's a practice for this for this month that we've been doing a service. It's about experiencing the many little debts to ourselves by quietly and unpretentiously caring about the needs of others. That's how we become the good news people. Let's pray. Jesus, may something explode in our heart. May our hearts be filled with worship. We worship you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Put on some worship music. Worship Him. Have a good Sunday, and we'll see you around.